All right, welcome back. We finished up all of 1 Samuel chapter 16 and our first lesson. Uh, so we're going to take a look. We're going to continue through the life of David. We gave the inter introductory information, a lot of introductory information about David's family. Uh, he was born about 1040 BC. He lived to be, I believe it was 70 years old, which means he would have lived into the 900s. Um, about 970 BC, he would have passed away. And Solomon takes his place. A lot of family intrigue is going to happen here. And it's interesting because it's almost like his family did not learn from the previous family. And, uh, and we'll see that a lot of things that go on in Saul and David's life get mirrored in David and his family. But at this point, Saul is at the point where God has officially rejected him. David is anointed king of Israel. Saul begins to be unhinged by the spirit, uh, the evil spirit that God commands to torment him. And, uh, and, and so uh, it's becoming obvious to the immediate people around him that Saul needs uh, to have some additional help. And so, uh, so a music therapist, as it were, is called, but it had to be just right qualifications. And I think the one that is mentioned last, both when they bring up the qualifications and in the description of David, is that God is with him. And obviously, this was a very, very important thing in the Bible. When you study something, lists uh, are very, very important. Um, and when something is listed in Scripture, it's listed by prominence. Uh, uh, oftentimes. And so when you, when you look at that, the very last thing, almost like it's climaxing up to this, this massive conclusion, an order of importance, he has to be a good musician. That's just, that, that's just a given. And he's got to be trustworthy and not, you know, not given to gossip, and then the Lord's got to be with him. And, and I think that the, that is something that defines David's life throughout. David um, is loved by Saul. A relationship develops that becomes kind of a love-hate relationship. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, but in, in, this, uh, in, the, in, in this class, we're going to kind of move on beyond the help that he gets, um, and, uh, that he gives, rather, to King Saul. And we're going to look in 1 Samuel chapter 17 now. We'll, we'll pick up the biblical text here in 1 Samuel ver, uh, chapter 17. We'll begin reading in verse 1. Uh, and it says this, um, now the Philistine gathered the Philistines. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongs to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Ezekah and Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And so the author of the book of 1 Samuel uh, here is really setting up a picture. Something is about to happen. We don't know what yet, but something major is going on. We have the two armies set in array against one another. You have on this mountain the Philistines, and you have on this mountain the Israelites, and this big valley between them. Oh, my word. Now what's going to happen? This is excellent storytelling. And by the way, those Near Eastern countries... Um, prided themselves on their ability to tell stories in a very poetic fashion. And we see that reflected very well in the King James uh, as, it, as it really tries to capture that sense of tension right at the moment before something is about to happen. We see that. So the Philistines invade Judah. They set up base camp at, uh, at Ephes Demim. Uh, I'm sorry, Ephes Demim. Uh, it's about 16 miles southwest of Jerusalem between the towns of Shoko and Azekah. Um, Israel sets up base camp on the opposing mountain just off of the valley of Elah. Now, we're introduced to a character at this point in verse 4. Let's go ahead and read down from verse 4 to verse 8, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, probably one of the most famous biblical villains, right? Goliath. All right, let's start reading in verse 4. And there went out a champion uh, out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and the target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. The shield was too heavy even for him to carry himself. They took a whole other man to just carry his shield. Verse 8, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? 
Am I not a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. So, uh, we'll talk about the challenge here in a second, but let's go back and let's describe Goliath a little bit. We see he's from Gath. Gath was one of the five royal cities of the Philistines. So it's quite possible that, uh, that, that uh, Goliath had some royal blood in him um, as he was uh, from one of the royal cities. It's not definitive, uh, and I don't think you can actually go back and, and, and grab that and say, yes, for sure, that's true. Um, but, but he obviously carries himself in a bearing that is, is very commanding. Now, his sheer size could be the cause of that as well, but they make sure to let you know that's from Gath. Another interesting thing is that this city, Gath, is going to remain incredibly significant in, throughout David's life. Uh, he, go, he goes back, he flees to Gath. At one point, he has to preserve his own life by acting like a madman to get out of Gath. And, and, and for whatever reason, this city is going to remain significant in David's life for the rest of his life. But Goliath is from Gath. He, he was, the Bible says that he was six cubits in a span. Um, all of the study that I've done, I do know that there is a long cubit, but according to Maimonides, who was a Jewish uh, scholar and rabbi, uh, from the from a, a long time ago, I can't remember off the top of my head, but he several hundred years ago uh, said that the Hebrew cubit was about uh, what would be considered one and a half feet ish. Now, obviously, there weren't feet back then. Um, what the way they described it was uh, that that a span was four fingers width from one end to the other when the hand is closed. A finger's width was the width of a thumb, and a cubit was six fingers width from the from six hand breaths from the tip of the finger to the elbow. This is a cubit. And on average, that's about 18 inches. Um, a span, like I said, is, is nine inches. So if you do the math, he was, uh, he was six cubits in a span. He was roughly nine foot, nine inches tall. And this has been ridiculed by a lot of modern people. Oh, there can't be, a, we've never found any, any remains of anybody that was over uh, you know, over nine foot. The Bible is obviously exaggerating this here. Uh, let me give you a couple of details from modern history. Uh, Robert Wadlow, uh, the, ta- the tallest recorded man in recent modern history, he was eight foot 11 inches. Eight foot 11 inches. That's really only 10 inches shorter than Goliath. And I don't think that that is way out there as being a massive problem to assume the Bible is correct, that Goliath is nine foot nine inches tall. Um, Robert Wadlow, eight foot, uh, eight foot eleven. John Rogan was eight foot nine. That's one foot shorter than Goliath. And I know twelve inches can be big, and ten inches can be a big deal. But the bottom line is this: he was huge. <laughs> this was a big man, and I do trust the biblical text. I do believe that he was well over nine foot, approaching ten foot tall. His helmet was a brass. His coat of mail was uh, was was also made of brass. Uh, it was it weighed five thousand shekels. Now. Let's talk about what mail is first. Mail is little rings that are interlocked, and these little interlocking rings are used to shape things. In this case, his coat, it was his body armor, it was, it was mail, uh, and it was made out of brass, uh, ironically enough, um, which has some give to it and whatnot, but, but it weighed 5,000 shekels. Now, a shekel, uh, about 1,000 shekels is about 20 pounds. So 5,000 shekels... His coat weighed about 100 pounds. That's how heavy this coat was. Just the coat. Um, his leg armor made of brass. His target, or, or what they call the throat armor, this says it was sat between his shoulders, it would be a kind of throat armor, was made of brass. His spear stick was as big as a weaver's beam. And if you know, we're not talking about, you know, making pot holders here. We're talking about massive looms that made yards of cloth, and the, and the, 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 the weaver's uh, uh, shuttle that goes between those were massive sticks that, that had to carry the yarn all the way through, or the, the, the wool all the way through uh, from one end of the wall, uh, creating the woof. And, and so this was a massive thing. Uh, his spearhead was made of iron, weighed 600 shekels, 15 pounds. That's three sacks of potatoes just for his spearhead. That's all I'm saying. Everything has a culinary context, even in the Bible. 15 pounds for his spearhead. He's just whipping this thing around. He's throwing it far. He's a man of war. 
15 pound spearhead. I struggle with a three pound um, uh, sledgehammer, right? This guy's whipping around 15 pounds and carrying it along with him like it's nothing. His shield was so huge, it had to be carried by somebody else in front of him. We see that this is Goliath, Goliath of Gath. And we see that he comes out and he challenges Israel and he challenges personally, challenges King Saul. And he says, send me out a man. And you almost get a, a taunting a man if you have one over there. Send one over here and we'll fight with him. So he kind of issues a challenge in verse number eight. Let's read his challenge. Uh, and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. You can almost see the intensity in his voice. Uh, it just, I just dare you to send anybody that's able to come out and, 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 and match my skills and ability, match my height, match my training, match my armor. I just, I defy you to do anything about this. I mean, that's kind of a, a, an awful character. Uh, why, his, his view, and why do you set your battle in array? is a taunting question. He said, he, why bother challenging us, the Philistines? It's kind of the attitude in there. Send a warrior to fight me. And Goliath sets the ultimate ultimatum. So you can suffer defeat or eternal servitude. As if those were the only two options that could possibly be available to them. Well, there's one problem. There is somebody bigger than Goliath. And God is going to take a humble person to humble the arrogant. We see that time and again throughout Scripture, that the, the proud, the haughty is brought low. The humble are exalted. And we see that David is presented with an opportunity to gain some fame and some acclaim in what he has to do. And he does nothing but give the glory to God. Read this. This is, this is an amazing story. This really is. Look at verse number 11. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Saul and Israel began to tremble before the giant. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I don't think God has this one. How many times in, in a situation, or let's even think of our present circumstances here with, this, with all that's going on, that do we think, well, maybe God just doesn't quite have this one? I'm here to tell you, this Goliath will fall. Not because we're awesome, not because we wash our hands enough, not because we, 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 we uh, uh, just avoid each other forever and ever, but because God is in control, because God... Will, will, will always be bigger than whatever comes into our life. We do not need to be afraid. What a blessing. So we take a look at, at, at verse 12 now. We see David appears on the scene. Verse 12, now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. So that's how we know that that was the complete list of, of the brothers. The Bible says he had eight sons. Um, and the names of his three sons that, uh, I'm sorry, he had eight sons, and the, and the men went, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. In other words, he's saying by the time Goliath challenges Israel, Jesse's already an old man. So by the time David's a teenager, or probably a little bit older than a teenager at this point, uh, maybe an older teenager or a young 20s, um, Jesse's already an old man. He's already an old man. Um, he says that this man went, for, uh, went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. So verse 13, and the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So David's going to leave the scene, actually, this is still him being uh, in, in the palace, uh, so uh, the three oldest joined the army, verse 16, and the Philistines drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. And Jesse said unto David his son, 
Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp of thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. So let's stop there. Uh, that was verse 18. So we see that, 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 uh, that the three oldest brothers join Saul's army. David's the youngest. There are eight boys. And when his court position is eliminated, David just humbly and quietly returns to his duties as shepherd. Look at what it says there in verse 15. David went and returned from Saul. That sounds so simple, but the king's household, all the pleasures that that might have, any food you want at any time, the, the, the enjoyment of the surroundings and the favor of the king to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. He went back and did what he had done before. And I just think that's really cool. David's humility just shines here. He goes back. Not only is he humble, he's obedient to his father. Is this starting to sound like anybody else you can think of? He's humble and obedient to his father. Look at verse, um, uh, verse uh, 17. Jesse said to David, take an ephah of parched corn, take some bread, take some cheese down to your brothers, it says. So, so he's to deliver food to his brothers, to his, deliver some more food to his brother's captain, see that they're doing well, and then it says that he should take their pledge. Now, that, that actually means bring back something that proves that they're still okay. So he's been commanded to do this. Interestingly enough, he kind of gets attacked by his brothers for doing the very thing that his father asked him to do, and they begin to question his motives, and, and you can imagine how frustrating this, be, this must be. Look at verse 19. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel... We're in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. So David arrives just as they're going to make a charge, right? Uh, Verse... uh, well, I lost my place now. Of course I did. Verse uh, 21. For Israel and the Philistines have put the battle in array army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. So, just as the battle's opening, David walks in with these provisions. By the way, I think it's interesting too, just it's a minor detail, but these minor details are so important. When David left his responsibilities, he didn't just leave off his responsibilities. He left his sheep with another keeper. He was responsible for the things he was responsible for, even when he was not directly over them. And this is going to serve him well as he becomes a leader of the nation of Israel. Before that, a leader of the nation of Judah, or the tribe of Judah, and later on as, as king of all Israel, this is going to serve him well in choosing his advisors and, and, and in getting people under him who will obey him. Um, he, he is responsible enough that when he goes to do something else he's told to do, he takes care of all the responsibilities that are uh, involved in, in, uh, in obeying what he's been told to do. And I just think that's interesting. So he, leaves the, he left his provisions with his father's servant. He runs into the attacking forest, uh, forces and asks them how they're doing as they're charging into battle. So maybe he had a little bit of youthful stupidity here, <laughs> right? I'll grant that. So no wonder Eli was, was perhaps just a little bit annoyed here. They're getting ready to, ah, what are you doing here? Kind of an attitude, right? Look at verse uh, 23. Verse 23 says, and as he talked to them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. David didn't hear them the first time. Something different. Even just in the narrative, just pops into your spirit when you read those words. And David heard them. Has has your mother finally heard something that you were saying to your younger brother, right? You say something, you say something, but this time mom heard. (laughs) And something different is about to happen this time, right? And that's kind of the way I read this. Goliath comes out and gives us challenge, and the Philistines are going to fight the armies because nobody wants to fight man to man with Goliath. So we'll just take our losses and try to beat the whole army down and and and, and take it out this way. And so we're going to do it our way. And this time the Philistine comes out and he gives a challenge again. But this time, David heard it. I think that's very interesting. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, uh, 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 fled from him, very sore afraid. Immediately Israel begins retreating 
from this, this giant in every way, a giant in warfare, a giant in stature. Uh, they immediately begin to retreat. Let's look at verse 25. David, what everyone else sees is a fearsome uh, 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 host, a fearsome enemy to be afraid of. David sees as an opportunity. I wish we, myself included, would become more adept at looking at the things that initially scare us and realize that perhaps God is presenting us with an opportunity. You have more time to talk to your neighbor. You have more time to study your Bible. You have more time to bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This is an opportunity that God has given us. Oh, we can walk around being afraid and washing our hands 47 times a day, not against washing our hands. Or we can avail ourselves of this incredible opportunity that God has placed in our path. Look at verse 25. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel has he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So it shall be done to the man that killeth him. So, the king has uh, basically put a price on the head of Goliath. If you kill this, this enemy of Israel that defies God and defies God's armies and, and defies me, the king, I'll do this, this, and this. And this is what he says. He'll get great riches. He'll have the princess to wife, to, for wife, and he will free his father's household. I don't really understand that one entirely, except that I suppose if you are indentured uh, to another household that perhaps the king would say by royal decree, you're no longer their servant. That's the best I can ascertain from that. I doubt he's freeing anybody from the kingdom uh, or his overlordship necessarily. Um, so this really wouldn't have done a lot for Jesse since Jesse's father was uh, a free man already. But be that as it may, I think it's interesting that David's concern was for the testimony of Israel. David's concern was for the reputation of God. This was David's concern. Israel totally missed David's patriotism here. They totally missed the spiritual vision in this situation. And David is stunned to find grown warriors that are going to miss out on this incredible opportunity that is staring them right in the face. Look at verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the man, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. David kind of chides his brother and says, Listen, isn't it obvious there's a cause? He turns to the other guys and he said, no, wait a minute, what, what's going to happen again? <laughs> if somebody goes takes out this man, what, what's going to go on here? Uh, what, what, what are those rewards again? That's kind of sounded pretty cool. Look at, look at um, uh, the, Eliab then belittles David in verse 28, accuses him of pride and foolishness. David rebukes his brother and the other soldiers. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Let's suppose this goes horrible. How many countless millions face a negative eternity? Is there not a cause? Bold words. Bold words. They gang up on David, and David keeps asking the same question. The argument is reported to the king, and he calls for David. Look in verse 31. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. Now, I, I think this is interesting. David has an interview with Saul, and I want to take a look at that. Look at verse 32. Uh, and David said unto Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight, for this, uh, fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant, there's that humility again, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion 
and a bear, I took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. And the servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, saying, He hath defied the armies, the living God. David said, moreover, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go. And the Lord be with thee. And Saul armored David with his armor, and he put upon uh, and helmet, uh, and he put on, uh, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head, and also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off them. So we're we're kind of like building up to this major, uh, this major uh, point in the story where where where. David comes, finds out something's going on, and he decides, the youngest of everybody, he's not even in the army, decides, I'll take this guy out. Saul, he's brought to the king, and, 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 and David immediately offers to do battle with Goliath in verse 32. Saul argues, Goliath's skill in battle is no match for somebody so young as David. David gives his qualifications. Remember, we talked about this uh, in, in, the last, uh, in the last lesson. Uh, he slew a lion, he slew a bear. And something I just noticed, it almost seems like this happened at the same time. Like the lion and the bear came together and took a kid. I slew the lion and the bear. Now, it might have been two different instances, but when I read it this time, uh, there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. It almost seems like this was uh, a, 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 like an, a single incident, and he, and he was able to, to take care of the situation, whether it was a single incident or two different incidences. I couldn't imagine trying to fight hand-to-hand combat with a mountain lion, let alone some kind of an African lion um, that, 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 would, that would come after me uh, and, and hunt me down, they're, they're, those things are so strong. I couldn't imagine that. I don't even like dogs. I wouldn't want to be attacked by a dog, let alone a wild, vicious animal that's, you know, two and three times the size of something like that. And a bear. And he was able to take care of these things. And he gives the glory to God. The power is not in and of himself or in his own skill. The Lord is with him. David's testimony was such that Saul knew the Lord is with him. Saul knew it. David displays further trust in God. Saul's convinced and allows him to fight Goliath, but he tries to put his armor on him. Why? Because that's what Saul would have done. Uh, Saul would trust his armor. Saul would trust his skill, his height. He was the tallest man in Israel, according to the Bible. Saul would have trusted. In fact, if anybody were to go out and fight Goliath, it should have been Saul. He was the biggest most skilled warrior in all Israel, it should have been him out there against Goliath. And yet, his substitute fights on his behalf, but he wants him to wear his armor. He doesn't want to be uh, 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 called on the carpet, as it were, should, should something probably will happen to David. Well, he wore armor. I don't know what to tell you. David's like, I, can't, I haven't proved these. I've, I've never fought with this stuff on. I can't do this. And he puts the armor off and gets ready to turn and fight the giant, and you think, whoa. I mean, we know how it ends, because we all know we're familiar with the story, but if you weren't, you could see how engaging this is in the story and what in the world is about to happen in this situation. Look at verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So he put away the weapons he wasn't familiar with. And he took with him the weapons he was familiar with. He brought a staff, he brought his st- some stones, and he brought his sling. And now we see that he draws near the Philistine. Look at verse 41. He advances onto the field. And this, is, this just gets so intense. Verse 41, And the Philistine came on and drew near to David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. 
But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with a sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Big words for a little guy. Facing a man of war, probably three times his size, right? Well, maybe not three times his size, but, but you know, at least double his size. And this guy, a war, man of war from his youth, I, the, 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 the situation is just almost comical to read. It's just, such confidence David had in his God. David advances onto the field uh, with a with, with a shield bearer. Goliath catches a glimpse of him, and begins mocking him. David declares the victory by the might and glory of God. David charges the entire Philistine army alone and kills Goliath with a single stone from his sling. Look at verse forty-eight. And it came to pass that when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in, the, in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell again his face to the earth. Now he fell upon his face to the earth. Just boom, splat, <laughs> right down in the middle of that, of that valley in front of all the Philistine army who just thought they had something. Uh, David David just kills this guy. And then we see in verse 50, So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Cowards. And you can be sure that what you're trusting in, besides God, will fail you. And when it does fail you, what you were trusting in, when it is gone, you will be afraid. You will be afraid. You know why David could advance without fear? I'm not saying he wasn't scared of the situation, but he was sure of his own victory because he trusted in God. He trusted in God. How many of us get scared by our circumstances, get, 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 get sidetracked by our, by our own uh, ideas, and we come up with solutions, and this is how this is going to work for sure. I can, I can be certain that this is the way God's going to work this out. And when, when those, those, uh, those uh, sandcastles crumble, we're afraid, and we have no idea what to do next because we were trusting in something besides God. Oh, we need to be so careful of that. We need to be so, so careful of that. The Philistine army tries to escape, but Israel says, "Mm -mm, not so fast. Look at verse 52. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they'll come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shearim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. Now, let's stop there for a second. We'll continue reading in a moment. Well, let's read one more verse, verse 54. Uh, 54, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Now, a couple of things happened. Israel chased him all the way back to Ekron, which is the northernmost of the five cities that held by the Philistines. Um, so, they, they, I mean, they ran a whole way, chasing them, uh, making sure the, the, the wounded were dead, and really trying to teach these people a lesson, don't be bugging us. Um, ver, uh, Israel spoiled the Philistine base of operations, and David brings the head of Goliath to Jerusalem, but he keeps Goliath's armor for himself. Um, I believe we'll, we'll hear more about Goliath's sword later on. I, I'm trying to remember just off the top of my head. Um, I'm pretty sure that he speaks about it. And I know um, that while David is in Gath, he also acquires a harp, and we'll talk about that a little more. Um, he, he, he names it. He names it Giddeth, or it means of Gath. If you read in some of the psalm headings, you'll see it's something that something, says something like, upon Giddeth. And uh, in other words, that psalm was accompanied on the harp that David had acquired in Gath. I just think that's kind of interesting. It has nothing to do with this particular story, um, but I just think that's kind of fascinating. 
So, so we see that, that uh, Goliath is dead. David overcomes his enemy because he trusts in God. Guys, if we put our trust in God, he's got this. He's got this. Look uh, now in verse 55. David uh, is elevated by God and begins training for his kingship. Let's begin reading in verse 55. Uh, and when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. So evidently, I don't know, it's kind of odd because Saul told him what to do. It's almost like Saul gave him his armor and walked off. And all of a sudden, this kid, I don't know, as if there would be two kids that would be willing to fight Goliath, um, shows up without his armor, and he has, has any idea who might have gone out and killed Goliath. It's kind of strange. Saul doesn't make sense in my mind sometimes. Um, but, and Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Inquire thou whose son the strapling is. And as David re returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. And it's almost like Saul doesn't even recognize him. I don't know how much time has passed between, between uh, him serving as kind of a music therapist slash armor bearer and, and the slaying of Goliath, but it really can't be too much time. It was only 30 years before David is crowned king. Um, so I'm, I'm not exactly certain about how much time has actually passed, uh, but, but it seems like Saul totally does not recognize David here. Maybe he grew a beard at the time or something. I have no idea. But... Um, um, I, think, I think it's very, very interesting that David proves his scale, a skill not only musicianship, but now in his cunning as a warrior. And, uh, and I just think it's so odd that, that, that Saul just totally doesn't recognize David. He, he even says, I'm, I'm thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. He, he, he had to know some of David's background, you would think. So it's kind of strange. It's almost like um, Saul really is already starting to slip a cog at this point. Either that or David just totally changed. I don't know. I, I don't understand it entirely. Uh, Saul's family now begins to take an interest in David as well. So chapter 18, we kind of see um, the story beginning to develop. Uh, Saul's son Jonathan comes into the picture here. And it came to pass uh, when he uh, made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. No. Let's take a look at this a little more in depth. Saul's son Jonathan takes note of David's qualities and immediately gains a respect for him that develops into a deep and abiding friendship, yea, a love. Now, I want to be very clear. This is not a sexual relationship. This is um, a knitting of the heart that is binding, that is uh, soul-tying. It's a positive soul tie. And it, 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 David and Jonathan became more than friends. They became the closest of friends. And it remains this way for the rest of Jonathan's life. And I think it's something that's very, very interesting. Um, Saul has been king for some time now. Jonathan's been alive for some time now. David is probably less than 20. Uh, Jonathan is probably significantly older than David is. We see a lot of Bible story uh, artwork and whatnot, and it's David and, and Jonathan are like, you know, 17, 16, 17 years old together, and I kind of don't think that's the way it is. It seems from the Bible, the biblical timeline that Jonathan is probably significantly older than David is, and yet this amazing friendship develops between them. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful relationship that a lot of guys never will have the opportunity to avail themselves of, and uh, it's, it's, this is a deep and abiding friendship. And Jonathan, I believe, feared God and was submitted to his will. Jonathan, to me, is a symbol of, of somebody who submits to the will of God. And it kind of has a tragic end. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, 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 Saul presses David into the king's service at this point. No, you're not going home now, bud, because you, you, know, you did all this stuff before, if you remembered. And, and now um, you know, you, you're, you're a national hero. Guess what? You get to stay here. Uh, but Jonathan raises David's official status with above-status gifts. 
um, his own robe and his weapons, and th- these were symbolic, uh, like like uh, like um, uh, Joseph's coat of many colors. It wasn't just a gift from his father. There was a symbolism in 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 that gift, as there is here. It's almost uh, an act of submission of Jonathan to who David was. And I start to perceive at this point that at, at some we're not told when Saul found out who was king, who was an anointed king, um, but when when he announces who he is the son of, all of a sudden the rest of the family perk up. Jonathan begins to take notice, and he gives him these these royal gifts, and it's almost as if um, you know Saul saying, "No, you're staying in the palace." Jonathan giving him these gifts, it's almost as if there's a knowledge that there's at least something much bigger going on with this young man, and, uh, and, and quite possibly are aware of what is supposed to happen in the future. Saul is a little more submitted to God at this point uh, in his life, um, as he, then he will be later on when he begins to say, I don't care if you're the next one that God wants to be on the throne, I'm going to kill you. Um, he's not quite there yet. So if he knew, it could be Saul's way of saying, okay, fine, um, you know, let's stay in the palace. Uh, it could also have been a political move in that um, Saul uh, was keeping his friends close and his enemies closer, as it were, or in this case, not necessarily an enemy, but a rival. Um, and, and so I'll keep an eye on him, make sure he doesn't try to take over my kingdom uh, kind of an attitude. or not really told, and Saul was known to be suspicious like that. Um, so there could be some of that playing into it as well. Uh, Saul does indeed become very suspicious of David uh, and what and what uh, his abilities and, and whatnot. Let's look at verse five. David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and he behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. Now, they came out to meet King Saul, mind you. This party was for him. Our king has triumphed in battle. Okay, and the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. But that's not how Saul heard it. Saul heard it as Saul has slain thousands and David is tens of thousands. You ever seen something like that in a movie where, where, where they show what happened and they show the, the, that character's perception of what happened? I kind of read it that way. The, the people are like, Saul slain thousands, and David slain tens of thousands, and, and, and we won. The Lord gave us the victory. Hooray. And Saul hears, Saul's only slain thousands. And whoa, David has slain tens of thousands. And, and you can see where, where his own self-conceit and, 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 and self-importance begin to warp his mind. And I think maybe um, the, the evil spirit works on him throughout the rest of his life that, that, that the Lord kind of assigns to him. And... Um, and, and he just really, this is the first time he begins to really outwardly display um, uh, jealousy and suspicion of David. Look in uh, verse 8, and Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me have ascribed but thousands. And what more can he have, or, and what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. He views him with, with an eye of suspicion. He's going to try to take my kingdom from me. I don't think so. Uh, verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, and he said, For I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. So, so we see that, that, that unrepentant of his sin, God now judges Saul with a troubled spirit again uh, that begins to toy with his mind to the extent that he now lashes out in fear and jealousy and rage irrationally. David humbly resumes his court duties with no expectation of anything greater. Again, there's his humility. 
Saul attempts the murder of David. In fact, in verse 11, it says twice he, he, had, to, he had to leave his presence or, or face death himself. Unable to deal with the guilt of knowing God has chosen another, Saul removes David from his appointment of court musician and makes him a captain over a thousand men. Now, this is going to backfire on him. He's just annoyed by this continual reminder of how much of a failure he is as a king get out of my presence, but I can't just throw you back to your father's house because you're a national hero, so what am I going to do with you? I'll make you a captain over a thousand. You're welcome. Well, this is going to become a big problem for Saul because, remember, we said that he was a comely person. David is just the kind of person, it was kind of a, a people magnet. People loved him. He just was a, 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 one of these people that people were drawn to. This is exactly what happens. Look at verse 14. And David behaved, behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. David continues to impress and to earn honor and to earn respect. And now David is in daily contact with the people. And this just begins to feed Saul's fears even more. And it's just some of the weirdest stuff begins happening now at this point. Uh, we're going to see uh, here in the next lesson that, 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 that David marries into the royal family, which is kind of an odd situation. And, and David begin, uh, Saul begins making unrealistic demands of, of his family. And uh, just he becomes completely unhinged. And yet, in all this situation, which is at this point now a very dangerous situation for David, he remains humble, he remains obedient, he remains responsible, he behaves himself wisely before all his, before all his friends and his enemies, and he earns everybody's respect. And a, if you're the kind of person that nobody really has much bad to say about, it makes the rest of humanity look at you and say, well, huh, they just think there's something, don't they? There's a, a kind of a jealousy bug, right, uh, of somebody who you think is the teacher's pet or who, who is you know, your boss's favorite or, or anything of that, uh, like that. And, and we tend to frown on those sorts of things uh, as in, in, in our human nature because we just, well, this must be nice for them to have all those favors. And the bottom line is, is that David really had a much better character than Saul, and that was paying off for him. Saul didn't like that. Uh, it made him jealous that he had the favor of the people. And many times when we try to find a way around an uncomfortable situation, those, un those, those ways that we use to get out of those uncomfortable situations turn around and make our situation even more uncomfortable than if we had faced the problem head on to begin with can't run from our problems. We can't push away the people that annoy us. We, we have to face these things because in trying to throw, uh, throw people under the bus or make our life more easy and comfortable, we tend to find ourselves in a position or in a situation where, uh, uh, where we have to dig ourselves out of a bigger pit. So we're going to end right there on uh, verse 16 of 1 Samuel chapter 18, 1 Samuel 18, 16. And we'll pick up next time in verse 17, and David's going to get married. Um, he's going he's gonna to try to start a family. Um, and then we're going to see what happens uh, to, uh, to David, uh, to his wife, to his relationship with Saul, his relationship with Jonathan. Uh, we will also take a look at one of the Psalms that he writes in the next lesson also. So, um, that's, so that's that. So stay with us because this, this life uh, biography of King David is just so exciting. So much happens to this man and he just remains humble through it all.